All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I am State Representative Rehab Ali Brennan. I represent Bethel D'Ambry writing a new town in the State House. Um, I've invited Chair G Marissa Gillette and our Peer Director of Legislation, Regulations, and, Commission and Communications, Taryn O'Connor, here today to better inform uh, the residents of the Second District on understanding their electricity bills. You know, we know that Connecticut residents pay some of the highest bills in the nation. Uh, you know, we've experienced disruption caused by storms, you know, increased rate hikes by Eversource, you know, and a lot of people are concerned with the impact the climate crisis will have on, you know, their homes and energy prices. Um, as vice chair of the Energy and Technology Committee and the co-chair of the Bipartisan Energy Clean Energy Caucus, you know, I've been working to address these issues. And um, in 2019, I was proud to support the state's largest expansion of offshore wind, um, you know, and spearhead the passage of solar energy legislation that uh, it helps increase consumer choice and protected um, over 2,200 local jobs. Uh, in 2020, um, as vice chair of the committee, I helped pass the Take Back Our Grid Act. Um, you know, that makes our electric utilities more accountable for their performance um, and strengthens compensation for ratepayers uh, who lose power for significant periods of time. And, you know, I just really wanted to provide an opportunity for people to hear more. I know sometimes we get confused about, you know, what is our energy bill saying to us? Why is it so high? And why is Connecticut, you know, in one of the top three uh, states in the nation um, for residents paying high fees. And so I guess um, I'm gonna pass things over to Chair Gillette so she can uh, answer all those fun questions for us, um, but she'll present. And then obviously, if you guys have any questions at the end, we would be happy to hear um, from the residents. Uh, this is what this is here for you guys today to uh, to provide you that opportunity. So thank you to Chair Gillette and to Taryn O'Connor for being here. Thank you so much, Representative. I appreciate the opportunity and I really appreciate uh, each of you spending some time this evening uh, hearing our presentation and uh, giving us the opportunity to address uh, any questions that you may have. Um, I've been in this position for a little over three years now. I uh, moved here with my family from Maryland um, where I'd worked at. You know, every state has their own version of PIRA. Uh, they're usually called public utility commissions or uh, public service commissions. So I worked at the Maryland version of that um, for about a decade before, uh, before moving to Connecticut uh, for this role. Um, so I'm going to put up some slides and we're happy to share the slides afterwards. Uh, there's some embedded links in them um, and we're happy to share materials afterwards uh, to supplement any questions that you have this evening. Um, but I really like to start uh, these presentations um, by articulating, uh, you know, what Pura is um, and, uh, you know, what, all, what Pura is all about and how you get involved in Pura proceedings. Um, and through that, I can explain uh, a little bit about electric bills uh, and other items that are pending before us. Um, but I really like to start the pitch um, by uh, giving an overview of what our agency is. Um, because I think that we're one of the most misunderstood um, or just simply don't know about our agency um, in all of state government, which is really a shame because, um, you know, from my perspective, Pura has one of the most far-reaching impacts uh, in terms of the services that we regulate. Um, so what this slide is saying is a lot of words here. I'm going to boil it down uh, for you. Um, so Pura, as a quasi-judicial agency, so we have jurisdiction over a lot of the services that, uh, that affect you each day. Um, primarily electric and natural gas are the ones that we interact with the most. Um, we do regulate water and some limited telecommunications. So the big differentiator here between uh, what Pura oversees and what we don't is something um, that you see up on the screen uh, referred to as an investor owned utility. So what does this mean? Um, it's you know, really interesting when you think about uh, a public service or a public good like electricity or water and having that owned by a private entity. But in reality, um, that's what many of the services are. Um, they're called natural monopolies. Um, happy to get into the history lesson about how we got where we got. But the, the key takeaway here uh, is that there are these entities who are owned um, by shareholders uh, and they are private companies, um, but they are regulated by a state agency. Legislatures all across the United States have delegated this authority to um, their public service commissions, uh, where we undertake exercises like rate making um, and basically uh, act as a, uh, we're stepping in on behalf of the private market because these are utilities that have a natural monopoly. 
For example, um, for Eversource, uh, which I know is the electric utility that serves um, most of your district, uh, you're not, you, we're not gonna be in the instance of seeing multiple poles and wires for different entities. Um, so these are all natural monopolies and we're stepping in to, um, to set rates and act as uh, on behalf of um, what the private market would normally bring to the situation. Uh, so, um, you know, the screen now is showing all the different areas that we oversee. When you think about Pura, um, most commonly th things that uh, you think about are uh, setting rates, um, but we do a lot more than that, um, uh, including uh, overseeing the safety of a lot of this infrastructure, particularly on the gas pipeline side, um, and overseeing mergers, acquisitions, a lot of infrastructure build out. Um, but yes, again, our, our primary function is to serve in the rate setting uh, um, mechanism. So sometimes well, one of the easiest ways to explain what we do is also by talking about what we don't do. Um, so as the representative alluded to um, at the outset, uh, Pura is not Eversource. Pura is not UI. We are not the companies. Um, we also uh, do not exercise jurisdiction over a lot of the telecommunications or internet services um, that you may interact with. So um, while maybe two, three decades ago, uh, the answer would have been different. Um, in the early 2000s, there were a couple of big, um, big steps that legislatures across the country took, um, primarily to what they call deregulate. Um, so internet, uh, cable, uh, telephone, unless you have what's called plain old telephone service, which is copper-based um, telephone service, uh, that is all deemed to be uh, properly incentivized or regulated by the competitive market. So uh, unfortunately, if you're having issues with the prices or the rates that Frontier sets, that Comcast, Comcast sets, we are more than happy to help facilitate uh, you, know, you reaching a live person because I think we get that a lot. Um, you know, I just can't even contact someone at those companies. We are more than happy to help facilitate those contacts, but unfortunately we can't do things like tell Comcast they're charging too much money. I wish we could, <laughs> um, but that is outside of our jurisdiction. Um, as are things like heating oil companies. So the big line here is anything that has a natural competitor or you know, in theory has competition around it, um, generally it's gonna fall outside of uh, what Pira has oversight over. That being said, we do ex exercise a lot of authority. And as the representative stated with the Take Back Our Grid Act a couple of years ago, that made a huge um, step in what I think is the right direction in terms of re-empowering Pira to exercise some accountability mechanisms that I think Pura over the years had been stripped of, intentionally or not. Um, but in my judgment, having moved here from another jurisdiction, having seen how it's done elsewhere in the country, there are certain things that other regulators are empowered to do um, uh, that Connecticut was lacking. For example, um, in the Take Back Our Grid Act, uh, we are now allowed to require the electric companies to provide compensation to ratepayers. Uh, when you have an extended outage um, and you see spoiled food or spoiled medication. Uh, so those are things that we not, were not previously allowed to do. We could order it, but then the utility would be allowed to recover that um, cost through rates, which really defeats the whole purpose there, um, I think. So um, there are a number of things that we're moving in the right direction in terms of being able to um, <clears throat> exercise additional accountability. Uh, so um, the reason I like to show this screen uh, is a couple fold and continuing in the theme of Pira being one of the least understood agencies. If you're familiar with other state agencies, you may think of um, a single commissioner or a secretary or, or some position such as that um, who's making the decisions. Uh, Pura is not that way. Um, although I do exercise some additional oversight over the agenda of Pura or, or things like that. Um, Pure is actually a three-person board. Um, so we're a quasi-judicial agency. 
which means that the decisions that we make um, are a majority are a majority vote. There are three commissioners who are essentially acting like a court, um, where the commissioners are uh, sitting as essentially judges uh, overseeing a litigated proceeding where the parties are making their cases. So I have two colleagues who are shown on the screen here. Um, so speaking of the period docket process, uh, and through this, um, I'm going to get to the point where I'm hoping to convince you to be involved uh, in period proceedings. Um, we operate a lot like a court. So um, at any given time, we will have between 80 and 100 dockets or investigations open or cases. So as I said, we have oversight over a lot of different companies and those companies are, in, uh, they want a lot of things or we or our stakeholders see that they're doing things that they shouldn't be. Um, so at any given time, we're investigating um, some aspect of them or uh, you know, pursuing um, a new program uh, and they all start by initiating a docket. So in these dockets, we kick off day one and we have a couple of uh, statutory um, stakeholders. Uh, so if you're familiar with other state agencies, there's a Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, uh, also known as DEEP. And then there's the Office of Consumer Council. Now, those two parties are state agencies who represent different types of interest in our dockets and investigations. So the OCC, and this is, um, you know, one, one question or flag that I get quite a bit is, um, isn't PURA supposed to be the watchdog um, uh, or advocate or act on behalf of consumers? Uh, that's not technically right. So if, if you flash back to one of the earlier screens that I had, the About Us, and you're hearing me talk about PURA being a uh, quasi-judicial agency with the commissioners being judges, we are supposed to be balancing the interests of parties before us. Now we can have a lengthy debate about whether that balance is being achieved. Um, uh, I don't think it has been, uh, but we are not uh, technically supposed to be advocating on behalf of customers. There is another state agency tasked with that role, um, the Office of Consumer Counsel, who intervenes um, if you're thinking about an analogy like Law and Order or Perry Mason or one of those um, you know, millions of uh, crime and legal shows out there, uh, we're not a criminal court, uh, but we are like a civil court where we're going to have um, attorneys representing all these different interests. And so they are going to step in once a docket has been initiated on behalf of their clients. Um, once that docket's open, no matter the subject matter, we're gonna do a couple of things that again, look a lot like a court process. We're gonna have technical meetings, which is just a fancy word for a stakeholder workshop, um, uh, a conference. Uh, we're gonna take um, written comments. We're gonna propound interrogatories, which is discovery. Um, uh, we're gonna have hearings. We're gonna have public comment processes. We're gonna develop a record. And so here's the, where I need you to focus in on why it's important to participate in a PURA process, no matter if you're representing yourself or another interest. PURA can only make a decision based on the evidence in front of us. So it doesn't matter if I personally know that the, you know, the sun is hot. <laughs> Unless a, a reliable witness has put in evidence into the docket that tells me that you know, they have a peer reviewed study that shows the sun is X temperature. I cannot make a decision making a finding on a disputed matter uh, declaring that the sun is in fact hot. So if you think back to a second ago where I talked about the stakeholders that are in our dockets, we do have OCC, we do have DEEP to the extent that they have the resources and participate in our dockets. But more common than not, we will go into a proceeding where it is just us and our staff and the utilities who have asked us to do something. So it is very difficult to reach a balanced decision unless we have balanced perspectives in front of us. So we are definitely on a mission to have conversations like the one we're having tonight to convince you that it's important to every aspect of your life 
water, electricity, gas, telecommunications, even to some degree, it is vitally important that we have additional perspectives in these dockets before us. Uh, so the rest of the screen, you probably had a chance to review by now, but it's again, just a lot like a court where we're gonna issue a decision at the end of developing this record. Um, it is a legally binding decision. Uh, so it is binding on any utilities that we regulate. If they disagree with us, and let me tell you, they have disagreed with me a lot lately. <laughs> they have the legal right to appeal any decision that I issue to the superior court. And then it proceeds from there. Um, but uh, we are um, operating like a judicial agency. Okay, um, and this just reiterates what I was talking through just a moment ago. Um, so you're gonna see quasi-judicial quite a bit here. Uh, we derive all of our authority from the legislature. Um, so it's also important to participate in the legislative process um, because any direction that they're giving, um, uh, whether it's you know adopting um, the 100% decarbonization by 2040, or they're telling us that electric vehicles are something they want us to pursue, anything that's happening at the legislature in terms of objectives, in terms of um, laws that they're putting out are things that we take and internalize and then ex um, essentially expand on um, through our dockets. Uh, another thing I'm talking about here, the um, I've not touched on ex parte rules. Um, this is also something that's uh, foreign to people. Um, but again, if you hearken back to uh, the law and order of Perry Mason, you may have seen, you remember clips from the show where um, the judge calls, you know, people back to their quarters. Well, it's almost always um, the representative, the lawyers from each of the parties. And that's because of ex parte concerns where you're essentially um, concerned that the judge is learning or hearing from one side without the other. And that applies to Pura. So myself and my colleagues and then all of my staff we are bound by ex parte provisions. So anything that is a pending open matter, I cannot discuss outside of a hearing room. I can discuss it in the sense like, oh, we have this open, the schedule is X, Y, Z. I cannot tell you, tell you how I'm gonna vote. I cannot answer substantive questions. And that's really to protect, um, you know, it's just to protect all of us. I don't think anyone on, that I've ever encountered wants me to be behind closed doors with Eversource, for example. Um, and uh, that is, um, that's prohibitive. I cannot have a phone call with them. Uh, I can't get a letter from them unless it is a public uh, letter that is then put into the docket and is available to everyone. Okay, so um, hopefully I'm starting to whet your appetite as to why you should participate in a peer ed process. Uh, you know, we've already gone over the fact that I cannot make a decision um, unless the evidence in the record supports the decision I'm making, unless the laws that um, PIRA has to follow support it. So if you're starting to think, hmm, I maybe should pay a little attention to what PIRA is up to, um, then I've got a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, starting at, you know, kind of the, the least involved to the most involved. Um, so if you want to become like a passive observer, you're starting to figure out that you don't have a ton of time, we maintain an online calendar that shows all of the dockets and the hearings that we're having, you know, that month in the coming weeks. Uh, so you'll see, um, you know, the dockets that we have coming up. Since COVID started, we've been doing, you know, 99% of our activities by Zoom. Uh, so if you want to log in, um, any day of the week and see what we're up to, uh, what hearing we're having that day. Again, a lot of what we do is, you know, a lot of jargon. Um, uh, we are working our hardest to make this more accessible so you can at least log in and see what we're up to and who we're talking to. Um, so you're welcome to log on to the calendar and see that anytime. You can also sign up for email. So say you log on to the online calendar and you see, oh, they're having a hearing on um the gas you know pipeline safety issue uh out in my neighborhood well i can sign up for email notifications anything that's going to get filed in that docket uh will come to your inbox 
Um, now, kind of scaling up. So say you've identified something that you um, are really keen on actually letting the commissioners know what your thought is. Uh, you can provide a comment during a public hearing. Now for certain types of hearing or cases, um, most notably rate cases, which I can touch on in a little bit, um, but the, the big proceedings where we are gonna set the distribution rates that um, affect a large portion of your bill, we will have separate and uh, separately noticed public comment hearings. Uh, so we'll do those in the evening like this. We'll come to your community. We'll do them by Zoom. Um, we'll also reserve time at the start of our evidentiary hearings for public comment. And again, most of these are happening by Zoom. We do do a few in the communities and also at our offices in New Britain. Um, but you can show up. You don't have to even sign up in advance. And you can offer you know, a couple minutes of your perspective um, on the matter that's pending before us. Um, we, and for the rate cases that we're doing, we're also putting out documents that talk about the types of content that you can provide us that will be um, meaningful and impactful. So uh, if you think about what I was saying, you know, that we have to rely on evidence, um, you know, we're encouraging folks to provide you know, concrete examples of how something is gonna affect you if it's approved or not approved. Um, but if you don't have time to show up at uh, one of these hearings, uh, we also take written comments at any time. And the great thing here is that for purposes of evidentiary weight, I, uh, we weigh um, comments that are received in writing the same as comments that are received in person. So do not stress if you have commitments and you can't get there during the day, during the night, uh, whenever we're holding these hearings, you can provide those comments in writing. Um, and you can do so by emailing um, the address that's shown on the screen. Now it's super helpful if you can put the subject matter, if you know the docket number, it's, it's you know, A plus, we will get it there. If you don't know the docket number and you just know, uh, I wanna comment on Eversource's you know, proposal to raise X rate. Um, if you put that in the subject line, we will get it where it needs to go. Um, so uh, really trying to just encourage as many comments um, with substantive information as possible. And it doesn't matter if it's one comment or a hundred, um, that one comment can definitely turn into something hugely impactful in the docket. So also don't feel like you need to recruit you know, a neighbor, a hundred neighbors to sign on to the same comment. Um, it doesn't get more weight in our proceedings, the more people that say it necessarily. Um, and, and, you know, if we have a hundred unique comments, uh, that's gonna carry more weight, but a hundred of the same comment, um, like a form letter, um, don't feel like you need to do that. One comment is um, just as impactful. So if you are, um, hugely motivated and you, and you can pull resources, the most um, impactful way to engage with PIRA is to formally intervene in one of these proceedings. Now that sounds scary and it is a little bit. It's got you know, some resource needs attached to it. Um, most notably, uh, the most successful interveners um, usually come with an attorney. Again, because we're a judicial agency. But um, I wanna show you an example of how providing public comment and um, also uh, intervening can be um, impactful. So this is a screenshot of uh, our decision in what was known as docket number 200803. So the docket numbers here, the first two correspond to the year in which it was initiated, so 2020. And this corresponds to the month it was initiated, so August 2020. So if anyone remembers back to August 2020 and what happened then, it was Tropical Storm Isaias. Um, so this is, the, this is a screenshot of one of the pages from that docket. And I love to use this example. There are many other examples that I could use um, from the past couple of years. This is a great one um, due to the magnitude of uh, how uh, public comment and intervention weighed in here. Um, so uh, what we'll do in a decision is we'll you know, kind of summarize the public comment. And what you can see on the screen is we received a lot of public comment from individual ratepayers. 
Um, but also we had some interveners from municipalities. So your town, um, and I don't recall if Bethel um, intervened, but a lot of the municipalities did. They pulled their resources, they got an attorney, they put their first left men and women up as witnesses. And we heard firsthand in an evidentiary proceeding um, what those uh, you know, executives of these towns had to deal with. And I can tell you from my experience, it was very moving. Um, it was you know, solid evidence that rebutted a lot of the narrative that the electric companies were proposing. And uh, what this led to um, was we imposed the maximum civil penalty on Eversource that was allowed under the law at the time. Now, Take Back Our Grid Act has since, um, if we're ever in the extremely unfortunate position again of having that happen, the Take Back Our Grid Act has allowed us to impose a steeper penalty um, at both the company level and in terms of restitution to customers. But at the time, this penalty was capped at 1% um, of, the, of Eversource's annual distribution revenues, uh, which amounted to about $28.4 million. So if you've seen over the past year, a credit on your bill, it was returned to customers um, over the course of a year as a credit that said TS, ECAS, now, $28.4 million sounds like a lot when I say it to you now. Um, when you divide that over the one point some odd million customers that Eversource has and spread it over 12 months, we're talking about maybe a cup of coffee a month. So, um, you know, in my experience, the biggest driver of behavioral change for these companies is to hit them in their pocketbook. Um, and so I continue to work with um, uh, folks like your representative on the Energy and Technology Committee to make sure that we're getting these companies' attention in that way. Um, but it, this is an excellent example of a case where I don't think, I don't know, of course, but I, I don't think we would have reached the result we did without the overwhelming amount of evidence that was bolstered by the municipalities and the individual rate payers. So if you are um, you know, interested in kind of poking around both at that docket or others that we have, um, we, we have, like I said, all of our materials are publicly available at any time. We have what, um, you know, this is our lovely, it's, it's not a very pretty system, um, but we have an online uh, case management system where if you know the docket number, um, you can type that in and it will generate a list of all the materials that are available in that docket, including if you yourself file a comment, it will become available immediately in this docket. Um, so uh, we are happy to come back. We have a few videos that we've posted to our YouTube account that, that walk you through this a little in a little bit more granular detail. Um, uh, but I do wanna emphasize that all of our materials are publicly available also, just a good hint for you, if you do file a comment, please um, don't put anything in there that you wouldn't want publicly available um, because we are required to disclose any comments that we have. So don't put your social security number, um, any personally identifiable information. Uh, uh, so um, just a heads up. Um, okay, so let's get to the meat of the matter. Uh, you, um, like me, are getting your electric bills for um, the month. Mine always comes this week of the month for the previous bill. Um, and it's going to be high. Now, it's not going to be as high as your neighbors in New Hampshire or Massachusetts for reasons that have to have to talk about in a moment. But it's going to be high. Um, and, uh, you know, the number, the absolute number one question I get is, why does it cost more to deliver the electricity than the supply? So we've taken some actions um, over the past couple of months that, uh, you know, you may have seen a story, we ran some press when we announced this decision about the redesign of the customer's electric bill. I want to be very clear that I know just as well as my colleagues know that redesigning the electric bill to make it more transparent what's going into each of those components is not in and of itself gonna make your bill cheaper. It's just not. 
we're, we're going to provide you more insight into what's in each of those components. Um, and uh, hopefully that's going to spark some conversations with our partners at the legislature, um, with our partners at other state agencies um, about actions and, you know, consequences of where that might raise different components of the bill, where it might lower it. Um, but I've tried to kind of explain that uh, here. So on average, residential customers use around 700 to 750 kilowatt hours a month. Now, if you have central air, um, school, uh, you know, heating and cooling really drive a lot of the electric usage. Um, that number is going to fluctuate depending on the time of year. But on average, over the course of a year, most residential users um, fluctuate around 700 to 750 kilowatt hours a month. Using that figure, um, what you're actually seeing on your bill um, is what's called supply, uh, which I'll get into in a second, which takes up about a third. And then everything else on your bill, um, which is currently labeled, uh, um, del here, I'll show the graphical depiction. This might look, with the exception of the numbers, on my bill's not this low. Um, uh, you'll see supply and delivery. Now what's actually in that delivery component of your bill are three things. And when the bill redesign launches, it's gonna take a couple of months for them to program their system. You'll see again, some more clarity into what's going into that delivery portion. Um, so the three components of delivery are the actual distribution of electricity. So the poles and wires, if you will. Then there's also the transmission, which is taking up an increasing amount of the bill. And then there are public policy costs. So trans, the, dis, the, diff, the difference between transmission and distribution, because I know a lot of people are like, okay, well, those just sound like synonyms. The best way I have to describe that is if you think about the, um, the difference between a highway and like a local access road, okay? So highways that are going um, between states uh, at high speeds, that's kind of like a transmission line. So they're the very tall, big towers that you see that are carrying electricity over far distances at high voltages. So that is different than the local distribution, which are more the poles and wires, or if you're in a community that's undergrounded, it's under underground. So they're more the things that are stepping down the electricity from the transmission to a voltage uh, that you can use at your individual home. So two different types of infrastructure regulated by two different uh, regulators. So Pura has jurisdiction over the distribution, which are rates that are set in rate cases, which happen every four years. So you may have seen in the news that UI is uh, United Illuminating, which is Eversource's counterpart and elsewhere in the state, they have just filed for a rate case that deals with distribution. And then the transmission rates, which are taking up an increasing amount of your bill, are regulated by the federal government because they're crossing state lines. Um, and then public policy costs are uh, costs that have been um, authorized uh, or required um, by the legislature um, you know, uh, and then are recovered through electric bills. So those are um, those are the components. Uh, you know, the bill is not going to be able to provide you know every last nuance. Like for example, the public policy costs. Um, there are very good reasons for a lot of those components. We're not going to be able to reflect um, necessarily the benefits that come from uh, those uh, costs, um, but they will provide insight into what you're getting for it. <clears throat> So another thing that I want to um, highlight on this bill is um, uh, under your current bill, it will say who your electric supplier is. Okay, this is a very important um, piece of the bill. When we get complaints into our customer call center about high bills, one of the first places we start is asking the customer who your electric supplier is. Now, if it says someone other than Eversource, that means you have either consciously or, or um, well, hopefully consciously selected what's known as a third-party electric supplier. So when we talked earlier about natural monopolies, um, 
Eversource as a distribution company is a natural monopoly. They do not have a monopoly on the supply of electricity. So about two decades ago, the legislature allowed, well, they required Eversource and UI to divest of their generation. So Eversource and UI, the regulated portions of those companies do not own generation. Um, now they have unregulated arms that I have no authority over. Um, Eversource, for example, has an unregulated arm that's in offshore wind, but their regulated uh, companies do not own generation. Uh, so if you do not want to get what's called standard service from Eversource, you can shop around. And I'm gonna show you the website. Um, oh, here we go. Um, there is a state-run website called EnergizeDT.com where you can go um, and check out what the electric supplier rates are. So um, to zoom in a little bit, there you should see a drop-down menu that says your electric supplier rates. You'll have an option to input your service territory, um, your average usage for the month, and it will kick out what the current supply rates are, and it will give you a comparison to what's called standard service. So standard service um, is the default rate that Eversource offers. So um, the, what they do is a couple times a year, they go out on the wholesale regional market and they run a competitive procurement to try to get the most um, uh, cost-effective uh, you know, energy that's available for purchase on the regional market for the next six months. So if you're on standard service, you'll recall that your rate changes January 1 and July 1. And um, that competitive procurement is overseen by Pura. So we make sure that they um, are procuring the cheapest electricity that there is uh, and that they you know, checked all those boxes. Um, but we're not setting the rate, unfortunately. Um, and Eversource is not getting a, a return on that. So they're not getting a profit on the supply portion of the bill. It is a pass-through cost that is reflecting the, the rate from the wholesale market. So um, if you don't want to take that standard service rate and you want to you want to get supply from a third-party supplier, you can. Um, I would caution you that while there are opportunities for savings here, it requires you to be very vigilant. Uh, a lot of these suppliers will offer a teaser rate. So they'll say, this rate, um, you know, if standard service right now is 12.05 cents per kilowatt hour, they may show you up on this rate board that they're gonna offer 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Now read the fine print, okay? Um, make sure that you know how long that rate is, is eligible for. And also what happens at the end of that term? Are they automatically gonna enroll you um, in another rate? And if so, what's that rate gonna be? Um, so uh, you know, if you have the time and energy, you know, no pun intended, to keep on top of this, you can save money. Um, but that is, uh, you know, buyer beware. Um, Representative, do you have a question on that point? I do, yeah. Do, yeah. Um, so this is only going to affect the supply side, though, right? The delivery side will stay the same, though. So uh, although the delivery side is what's kind of screwing people um, financially, um, at least you can kind of tinker with the supply side rate, um, you know, and I, knew, I do know that, you know, in the third party supply in Connecticut, it's not all that non-competitive, but, you know, at least I guess it's still somewhat of a, you still have somewhat of a chance to lower your rate, but the delivery is going to stay the same, unfortunately. Absolutely. Very good point. So um, we are talking about this supply portion of your rate. Now, unfortunately, that is going to become an increasingly high percentage of folks sold. So on July 1, uh, Eversource customers saw a, a slight uptick from that supply rate from the first half of the year, which was unprecedented, okay? So normally the supply rate goes down July 1 um, and it goes up on January 1. And that's because um, the wholesale market, and this is gonna sound a little bit counterintuitive, so stick with me, but between 55 and 70% of the generation in New England is sourced from natural gas. So even though we're talking about electricity here, the overwhelming majority of our electricity is sourced from natural gas. 
So when the whole thing, when the global market for gas is constrained, um, that has a huge impact on our regional electricity rates. So if you remember the start of the presentation, I talked about New Hampshire and Massachusetts. We have our, some colleagues in other states who did not have as robust of a procurement process as we did, um, where they're already exposed to the, the, global, um, the global upheaval in the rates of the wholesale market. So um, we did see a slight uptick on July 1. Uh, you know, I think so long as this, uh, you know, the global upheaval and constraints on the natural gas market continue, we're gonna face some issues going into next January. Um, so if you want to look uh, and shop around for a third party supplier, um, uh, I would just really caution you um, to stay on top of it. Um, but these next couple of months into the start of next year, um, you could certainly, uh, you know, play the market um, and see if you can uh, get it, get control on the supply side of your bill. Okay, so um, uh, if you've heard a little bit about third party suppliers, we were in the news yesterday or the day before, um, we do exercise enforcement over their activities. So if you find yourself in a bad situation with a third party supplier, we do have a division of my staff that is focused on regulating that market. So they have um, pretty robust uh, consumer protections surrounding them. Like they're not allowed to um, lie to you. I know this sounds straightforward, but they're not allowed to lie to you and tell you that they're cheaper than the utility if they're not, or make you any promises about um, specific savings. Uh, if you ask them to get off of their rate, they can't charge you a, a termination fee. Um, and conversely, a lot of these suppliers have recently gone out of business. Um, and that's because they just weren't eking out enough of a difference uh, on the regional market between what the supply rate is. So in those cases, and this is the docket that we were in the news for the past day or so, we are empowered to step in and order that company to pay restitution to customers. So in this case, there was a supplier, Sunwave, who went out of business they did have some customers who were going to save money compared to the standard service rate. So we have ordered them to pay restitution in the amount of $20 per month of the remainder of that contract to customers. So if you're having an issue with your third party supplier, if you choose to shop, please do not hesitate to call us and um, our numbers are on the screen. We take phone calls. Um, you, you can still mail us something if you want to. Uh, you can email us, um, you can file a complaint online. So if you have questions about your third party supplier, about an issue you're having with your utility, um, these are the numbers to call if the issue is specific to you. Now, earlier in the presentation, I gave you a different email address and that email address is for a comment you wanna make in a docket. So the difference being, I have a question about my specific utility bill. Okay, please email or call here. If you want to make a comment like, you know, I'm going to get myself in trouble by making an example, but if you want to make a comment um, about ABC utility, it should not get a rate increase because, um, you know, their profit was X and these are all the reasons why they shouldn't, that kind of comment goes into a docket and that's emailed um, to us and considered publicly. So, um, you know, there are a couple other things that I could cover, um, but for now, I think we still have about 15 minutes. I'm happy to take any questions um, or go over any of that material again. Yeah, don't be shy, guys. If anyone has any questions, um, I, think, I want to thank you, Chair Gillette. I think, you know, especially the supply and the um, delivery explanation, it was so eloquent, and, you know, that's why you're the chair. But, um, you know, it's hard when you're trying to determine what you're receiving. And uh, I appreciate those comments and you letting all that out for us. That's kind of like the biggest uh, question I got um, from most folks about um, their energy bill. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any specific questions? Um, don't be shy. Reverend? I'm actually not Reverend, but I'm, I'm using her, oh. her uh, <laughs> account. I'm. I'm the senior warden at our church, and, and we've been trying to um, get part of our property um, 
uh, as a solar array um, to get back to the grid. And um, we were working with Viroji um, Energy and they told us that UI does not have enough in infrastructure. They're only at four kilovolts and we need 13.8 kilovolts. How do we get them to increase their kilovolts so that we can proceed with this solar array? Great question. So I'm going to give you a brief answer, but then I would highly suggest that um, that a representative uh, reach out to the pura.information at ct.gov um, uh, email address as uh, we can um, uh, definitely get more into the specifics there. So the question is, um, as I understand it, about something called interconnection. So um, this happens anytime someone's seeking to interconnect a solar array, a battery to the grid, the grid has to be able to support it. Um, and uh, the, the issue is historically, um, the, the treatment of it has been the utilities say, okay, we'll interconnect it if you end use customer. Um, so in this case, your church pay for the upgrades that the system requires to interconnect it. That was historically. Now we are working in a docket right now to transition to a different model um, that requires the utilities to um, interconnect these systems and use a different cost allocation model um, because what may cost $20,000 to um, you know, you church to pay for upgrades so that your solar array can connect would cost pennies when you're socializing it to ratepayers. And then we use different tests that say, okay, well, we can't socialize costs of everything, right? We can't spread out costs over for everything over all rate payers, otherwise everyone's bill is going to go up. So we have to use um, uh, cost causation models, cost benefit analyses to make sure that the benefits that that solar system is going to bring um, to the grid outweigh the cost of socializing that interconnection. So we're working on it. Um, uh, so if it's not fixed now, we're hoping to have a decision in the next six months. So it, I would, if you could reach out to our um, consumer affairs folks and let's just dig into it a little bit more and make sure that UI is providing the accurate information, um, then uh, at the very least, we can get your, doc, your comments in our docket in support of a decision we make there. And I put, my, um, I put my email in the... Uh in the chat. So if you want to just email me directly and then I'll connect you. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sir, Richard. Uh, hi, first, thank you very much for this presentation and could have been advertised. Uh, it's a pretty small audience for uh, such a high quality and informative uh, discussion. Uh, I'm in Reading, Connecticut, and we have two current uh, Eversource pending projects in town, which you know about. One of them is extremely contentious and the other one should be. Uh, and as you said, uh, specifics should not be brought up in, the, in a, informally and uh, so forth. But I'm a technical guy. I'm a PhD physicist. I've been involved in um, helping the siting council get undergrounding in Connecticut 18 years ago. Uh, I'm interested in both projects right now. One of them's in my backyard. Uh, the technical side is what I can speak to better than the aesthetic, the community, the scenic, the intangibles, which you also don't deal with in, in general. So on the technical side, the problem is as follows. The town or people who inquire cannot access technical information on a pending project from Eversource. That is a guaranteed fact. I can't get a plan of what they're proposing to do. And the plan to me is something that has dimensions, voltages, connections, and so forth. They will not provide that. They'll keep it secret. CLNP, on the other hand, was a little better at that before in the days before. As a result, the public, whether the public is technically qualified or can hire someone who's technically qualified, the public has no mechanism for re responding to one of your dockets. We don't have the information. 
And on the flip side, again, my experiences with the Siting Council, another quasi-public agency, uh, the flip side is your agency may or may not have the ability to hire the proper technical authorities to independently evaluate something. In the case of one project, let's call it the contentious project in Reading and 12 other communities. To me, as a guy who has designed a lot of stuff with wiring, uh, it's wrong. It's not that it's ugly or it's unscenic, it's wrong if the intent is to provide reliability to the town uh, or to enhance the grid, either way. Uh, and that is one of your charter missions. So the question is, how can you respond to something if you can't find out what it is until after the fact and when it's been approved? Now, just without letting any actual specifics escape, uh, one issue, the overriding issue in these United States right now is the potential huge, huge increase in electrification for homes and for vehicles and so forth. What we have in this state in particular is an extremely creaky apparatus that can't handle it. So let's say a project now is called maintenance and it proposes to provide the same structures and the same transmission and distribution facilities that it replaces. When the future says 200% is what you're going to need in, in 15 years or so, or in the case of the other big project in town, how something involving 345 kV lines could be built and 15 years later, the utility says they're worn out, must be replaced. How can that happen in an atmosphere where you're trying to keep costs moderate? Who would authorize a high tension line that has a lifetime of 15 years? Well, that's what we're, we're told Yes, we need to replace it. We don't have the information. You don't have the information. The siting council doesn't have the information. And it's really, uh, it's unusual. And it's, you can say it's a very small state. We don't have the resources across the board. If you have a problem, you can usually just call the governor. But uh, the problem really is it's inhibiting the electrification of my town. Uh, specifically, we almost went photovoltaic with our high school, but Eversource's lobbying was able to, to prevent our town from adding a two megawatt facility at our high school. And again, that they have a lot of power and I don't think that Pure or anybody else has power over them. So again, I would thank you, but I certainly will be replying to a couple of these dockets. Uh, and I hope that on the flip side, that your agency has the ability to go to outside sources and say, does this make sense? Or are, is this being built for some other purpose? For example, again, I'm getting long-winded. Another purpose would be, is this a super highway with no off ramps? That is, it's benefiting interstate commerce from a private company rather than supplying utilities to the state of Connecticut. Case in point, the big natural gas power line, FERC approved. What's it for? Well, it's to supply Europe. That's what it's for. It's not to supply me, it's to supply Europe. Does that mean that that company has the power of almost unlimited eminent dom domain and protections uh, and tax freedom for doing something that does not benefit the residents of Connecticut in any way whatsoever? And that's, so, sorry, I just, I can go on for hours. No, so um, I really enjoy conversations like this because I suspect that there are more like you who have comments that would assist Pura in our docket. So I have good news and bad news for you. Um, the bad news is we are unlikely um, to be able to, I don't know if I wanna say that. Um, 
So the good news, let me just leave with the good news, um, is that PARA uh, has what's called an equitable modern grid initiative. I'm happy to come back and do another presentation on that. Uh, we have materials on our website, but it focuses on 11 different ways that the grid needs to be modernized in order to support electrification and other state policies. Because while it's really important that we focus on things like the representative has championed, like offshore wind and getting the fuels that we rely on to be green, it's not gonna matter if the infrastructure is not there to deliver it. So PIRO's Equitable Modern Grid Initiative is focused on making sure that the infrastructure itself is capable of um, being resilient, reliable. So the good news here is uh, on August 31st, and let me ask Tara and my staff to, um, perhaps while I'm talking, put it into the chat, a link to the final decision. We just finished the eighth track of our Equitable Modern Grid which uh, was focused on reliability and resilience and specifically creating frameworks that kind of uh, bridge that what I, what I think you're referring to and I agree with is an inf information disadvantage between you know, Pura and the utilities we regulate, really between everyone in the utilities, right? Because historically, Pura and our, you know, our compatriots across the country are focused on what's called um, uh, you know, we're looking backwards. We're looking at things that the utilities have put into place and the standards are, is it used and useful? Was it prudent and reasonable? These are all legal terms of art, but they're all looking backwards. And so we're not in the driver's seat in terms of understanding at the outset, is this project going to address X, Y, and Z? Um, because that's simply not how regulators regulate, okay? <laughs> and that is not okay with me. I don't think it's okay with you. I don't, I don't think it's okay with you based on what I'm hearing. And it do, it's not okay with anyone that I talk to really. So the decision that we issued on August 31st, um, everything we do has to be prospective in nature. I can't reach backwards, um, but I can require them and I am requiring them on a forward looking basis to put before us um, a re reliability and resilience comprehensive portfolio that allows all of our stakeholders in a rate case to look at what they want to spend moving forward and make sure that it's achieving um, certain metrics and things are measurable. Um, so I have this solution going forward. Um, what, why I'm saying there's bad news is I can't reach backward. Um, so, you know, I can advise you, well, advise is, my lawyers probably would tell me I can't advise you either, but I can tell you where you can look in existing statutes to see what existing protections exist. Vegetation management statutes right now are highly focused on notice requirements. So most of the power now is gonna be invested in what are called abutting property owners, um, the municipality, but they're really focused on notice and, and kind of the home rule um, uh, uh, perspective. So um, what I am hearing from, from rate payers, from people generally, is that they want PURA to be able to assess this stuff, vegetation management. They want us to be able to assess it on a comprehensive statewide basis, okay? And um, that's what I think our decision is gonna set us up to do. Um, we have not previously been set up to do that. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag of good and new, bad news there for you, but I, I can't disagree with anything you've said. Thank you. Any other questions here as we wrap up? I know it's uh, seven after 7.30, so um, appreciate the chair's time. and Hopefully you guys got some Good information out of this and a direction and where to go and obviously you know i will try um myself to promote maybe some important dockets that are happening and how you know just making sure to keep reminding people you know participate 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 so um and i appreciate everyone for being here as well uh, i know i see mary ellen woodman who's always on my facebook page talking about energy stuff and so i'm glad you're here as well um but again i want to thank chair gillette and taryn um I see Donna asked for a copy of the recording, which we'll provide, and then I'll try to get that on channel 23 as well. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. I wish everyone a great evening. All right. Take care.